And so now I'm gonna introduce our moderator for our next panel. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Chris Brown to you today. I will briefly read you his bio and then turn the panel over to him. Christopher Brown is the Senior Vice President for U.S. Business Partnerships and Global Public Affairs at Citigroup, leading national partnerships and ESG investments for the firm. Chris's 20 years of experience has built alignment across business, public policy, and consumer community goals. Prior to joining City, Chris served as senior staff in Congress and led public affairs functions across healthcare, nonprofit, and technology industries. He's a proud graduate of the University of Georgia and the DePaul University College of Law in, Chris, in Chicago. Please join us in welcoming Chris Brown. Thank you so much, Takara. I really appreciate the warm welcome. And uh, the one thing you left out of my intro is that I've been a long-term friend and, and colleague of Smart Growth America and just really appreciate the great work that you all are doing and leading this conversation. And such a phenomenal event. So thanks so much for having me and for having us to kick off a really interesting topic and a discussion around strategies for building wealth. Um, this is so timely. Uh, I think not just for me and for and for city, but I think for this nation. There have been so much conversation lately, research done, companies, institutions, communities really rethinking about their role in addressing what we broadly are terming the racial wealth gap. And that racial wealth gap really pointing to the historic inequities that this country has witnessed and have been a part of over the many, many decades and centuries that has led us to this place where we hear these figures. We hear um, some of the stats out there around nationally, communities of color and uh, Americans who are white having this huge gulf and divide in wealth. I've heard figures from 13 to one here in California where I live, that number is more like 88 to one in terms of wealth being held in households. And so generally speaking, how do different institutions and organizations really see themselves in thinking about what do we do about it? Um, some, some of our partners at Prosperity Now have conducted research several years ago that talked about if we did nothing, uh, it's gonna take us about 230 plus years or so to catch up uh, if we don't really start to think about how to turn the ship in a different way uh, as a nation. City is, is interested in this topic because of several reasons. <clears throat> One of which, you know, in some of the research that we recently released talks about the economic cost of the racial wealth divide, that this is not just a social imperative, that this is an economic one and a financial one, not just for the communities impacted, but also for the nation as a whole and for our economy. And so some of our data that we have, have released talks about the $16 trillion lost in GDP for the country as a result of the racial wealth gap and, and these historic inequities. And so we have to do something. And, and so City is really proud to be a part of this conversation. And I can share more at the right time around some of our initiatives around this effort. But I think it really does come down to partnership, how institutions can work together and how to really leverage each other to, to really address the problem because no single entity or organization or even company can really do this alone. It's really gonna take an all hands on deck approach. So we're really excited to point to several of our two leaders today and to have a, a conversation about some of the efforts that are underwear and underway at, at uh, Enterprise Community Partners as well as Black Cotton. So I'm really excited to introduce Chris Herman uh, the Chief Investment Officer and Fund Manager at uh, Enterprise Community Investment, uh, as well as Julius Tillery, uh, founder of Black Cotton and the North, and the North Carolina Black Farm Trust uh, Collaborative. Uh, I'm going to turn to you first, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, excited to engage and learn more about what Enterprise is up to in this space, uh, because for so long, many of the, uh, one of the first things that come to mind when people think about addressing the ra racial wealth divide really comes down to home ownership. And so you all bring a very um, interesting angle to the con conversation around home ownership. So we'd love to learn more about you and your work. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for inviting me to join the discussion today. Um, my name is Chris Herman and I am joining on behalf of Enterprise Community Partners, as you mentioned, 
Um, and just by way of introduction to our organization, Enterprise is a 40 year old nonprofit organization. And our mission is to make home and community places of pride, power and belonging and platforms for resilience and upward mobility for all. Um, we focus on three strategic priorities and those are to increase the supply of affordable homes, to advance racial equity after decades of systematic racism and housing, and to support residents and strengthen communities to be resilient to the unpredictable and make upward mobility possible. And over our 40 year history, we've invested about $54 billion to help create 873,000 homes in all 50 states. And more specifically, my role at Enterprise is to manage uh, impact investment funds that help us achieve our strategic priorities and advance our mission. And there are two things I wanted to highlight today that relate to this topic that we're actively working on. The first is an initiative called Equitable Path Forward, uh, which is Enterprise's five-year, $3.5 billion nationwide initiative to help dismantle the legacy of racism in housing. Um, and this includes what types of homes get built, where they're built, who builds them, uh, and the wealth they generate. Um, and specifically, I know, Chris, you asked me to, to comment on specific statistics. In the, in the real estate industry itself, only 2% of the developers are Black-led, um, and minority real estate firms control only 1.5% of assets under management. And, and one of the main causes for this disparity is that housing providers of color often lack access to sufficient capital. Um, and from a systems level standpoint, um, through the uh, equi Equitable Path Forward Initiative, we're, we're trying to increase the diversity of the developers who plan and build and ultimately generate wealth through affordable housing. Um, and this initiative includes helping, uh, helping to bridge the gap for BIPOC-led developers um, to capital, uh, making advisory services and other non-financial support available to BIPOC-led developers, and also creating new career pathways to diversify leadership in the affordable housing and community development industry. Um, so that's the initiative um, we're focused on at Enterprise that focuses on who builds and who works in the affordable housing sector, recognizing that um, the industry at large is not as diverse as the communities it serves. The second initiative I wanted to highlight is the Renter Wealth Creation Fund. Um, and this is a first of its kind resident informed investment fund that Enterprise launched late last year. Um, and the statistic that led us to launching this fund is, is really the striking wealth gap uh, wealth disparity between renters and homeowners in this country. And this is what you were alluding to in the introduction. Um, specifically, the, the median net worth of a homeowner in this country is about $255,000, while the median net worth of a renter is estimated at only $6,300. Um, and Enterprise, as you may know, is an organization that's primarily focused on rental housing. So so this 40 times difference in wealth outcomes between rentership and home ownership was something that we felt as an organization we had to tackle. And, and specifically as it relates to our goal, as I mentioned of advancing racial equity, 58% of black households and 52% of Hispanic or Latino households are renters. Um, and that compares to roughly 28% of white households who rent so there's a very real connection between the renter wealth gap and the racial equity wealth gap, racial wealth gap that you mentioned earlier that we saw an opportunity to address. And so using these statistics as a guide, um, we went on a, a journey to create an investment fund that commits to a more inclusive and equitable investment strategy. And one that effectively um, commits a substantial portion of its financial returns to improving wealth outcomes of renters who live at the properties the fund invests in. And so specifically, we've raised capital from what I describe as impact first investors that we use to purchase and preserve affordable housing nationwide. Um, and um, this is a strategy we've pursued through, through several prior investment funds over the last decade. Uh, and we'd of course normally expect to earn a financial return on that investment on behalf of our investment. And historically, all of the financial returns generated by those strategies have benefited landlords and investors. 
the Renner Wealth Creation Fund is really different in that it pushes back on this model, the legacy model of real estate investing, and is demonstrating that a portion of the financial returns can stay in the community as opposed to passing through it and be used to improve the wealth outcomes for residents who help make the community succeed in the first place. And our model commits to three distinct wealth creating initiatives um, uh, to support our residents. And that includes resident services. Every property the fund invests in will offer resident supports that are informed directly by the needs of residents and feedback that's generated from, from residents. The second is every property will offer monthly cashback rewards to residents when they make timely rent payments. We're targeting about a 5% cashback reward to residents each month to help them with their right now needs, whatever they might be, um, and to change the relationship between landlord and, and renters from a historically one-way street to more of a two-way uh, relationship um, in recognition of the role renters play in helping the community succeed. And lastly, we're committing a significant portion of the appreciation of the properties to long-term residents of the community through a sharing program. So, so overall, it, it's a combination of ongoing and long-term benefits, including direct cash payments to residents alongside resident supports. Um, and we, we describe the model as one where we're, we're putting our renters in the waterfall and making them true stakeholders in the community, as opposed to just treating them as a customer um, through which wealth is extracted for others. So um, it's not necessarily a home ownership model, but it is um, a, a, you know, simulating the experience homeowners might have uh, experienced, uh, had they be, or renters might have experienced had they been a homeowner within the experience of being a renter. Absolutely, it's such an innovative approach because you're right, it's not a traditional kind of home ownership uh, direct approach to home ownership uh, that is. Uh, but I think you're describing an ecosystem that has to exist in order for folks to have some options uh, in order to get on a pathway to get there, right? So it's really, really appreciate you sharing that. I think it's an interesting part of the conversation that probably doesn't get enough attention. Uh, Julius, I'll, I'll turn to you just, uh, just to say hello and introduce your work. And then I'll come back to both of you with a couple of uh, follow-up questions. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here today speaking with you. I'm Julius Tillery. I'm the founder of Black Cotton. We are a family farm business. Uh, I'm a fifth generation cotton farmer. And with my uh, family farm cotton that we grow, we have started to, uh, we have uh, developed home decor products that we sell across the nation. This has been like a, a strategy for building wealth in my community because I'm from a rural, poor, black majority, minority community. And what we have been able to do with our business is uh, use an asset-based development pro, um, pro, uh, process of trying to build uh, rural economic development up and creating jobs, creating opportunities. Uh, we've used our old abandoned school that's in our, our town to be able to use for our office location. And through that uh, abandoned school, we created a, a help created a town um, center, which has a public library and has uh, parks and recs involved with it. So basically what we're doing with our business is trying Trying to use the best of our assets that's available to us and to create pro, um, products that we can share without uh, throughout the country. Another thing that we're doing is basically trying to uh, alleviate some of the negative tropes around farming and agriculture and try to uh, promote positive ways that land ownership can help uh, family farms and families in, in poor communities and rural communities as well. Oh, yes. And one other thing I need to talk about with Black Cotton is, yes, we have a, a partnership with Vans, the shoe brand, where we're actually making uh, clothing from our uh, uh, from a cotton that we're growing now. We're in the first year of our drop of uh, dropping clothes, but uh, this is something else that we're really excited about is our partnerships with big, uh, you know, larger companies like uh, brands like VF and uh, um, Vans and connected to the corporation VF uh, Corporation. So there's a lot of opportunities that we're trying to develop with our cotton uh, that we're growing from our farm. So we want to promote other for, uh, family farmers to do the same, especially our, our, in our um, people of color community. Yeah, thanks so much, Julius. I'm going to stick with you for a moment because I know you're also doing some exciting work around uh, ownership of land. And so I would love for you to share a bit about that. Yes, I, I work for uh, the Black Family Land Trust. I'm the North Carolina representative and connecting to uh, opportunities around farmers. Um, 
keeping their land sustainable. What we like to do is pro, um, promote sustainable practices and conserva uh, conservation programs that help farmers, you know, pay farmers as well to be able to uh, conserve their land instead of developing it. So there's plenty of opportunities uh, connected to USDA and other land trust uh, organizations and nonprofits that help uh, landowners and small uh, small landowners conserve their land using these types of conservation practices. Mm -hmm. Because I see the connection, I'm hearing the connection between some of your earlier programs you were describing around small business, mm -hmm. uh, agriculture, uh, and the brand support, the merchandise being connected to the land itself. And how, if we think holistically, I mean, this has to be a part of the approach to think about wealth creation, um, because often those things are kind of segmented. Uh, is, is that kind of what I'm hearing a bit? Absolutely. It's a really good opportunity for uh, for landowners now because, you know, and farmers in general, because with Internet, people can connect better. You can, you know, I, I feel like I have opportunities that my father and grandfathers could never imagine as a farmer being able to connect with a customer base across the country and not have to depend so much on brokers to be able to exist as a farmer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, controlling land, uh, deciding what to do, grow and sell from products from that land um, that may have a little something to do with development, Chris. I don't know. Um, is there a connection there around strategies that the, the, the two of your organizations are working on could could really leverage each other here in terms of wealth creation? Yeah, no doubt that, you know, what what you're connecting the dots on here is that sense of ownership that that, you know, what comes with ownership, what comes with the ability to, um, you know, control your own destiny, if you will. Um, and extract wealth through your assets. And, um, you know, that's, that's part of certainly the, the uh, equitable path forward initiative of creating greater diversity in developers who ultimately own and benefit from affordable housing. It's a little more indirect in the renter wealth creation fund, because that um, is not necessarily an ownership model. I'll admit that's one of the things we tried to achieve, but didn't achieve in our model, right? It's intended to simulate ownership, but not be ownership and control. Um, there were lots of securities law limitations that we ran into and barriers ultimately that, you know, were difficult to overcome in the first model, but we hope to be able to in the future. So um, I, I certainly think we have a lot to learn, even though Julius and I work in different fields and worlds, um, uh, we have a lot to learn from each other in terms of uh, how we can address the racial wealth gap um, and achieve kind of greater equity in society at large. We all do. I think we're all seeking those connection points. Um, I also wanted to share, you know, there's there's a missing piece here um, that I don't want to go unnamed, and that is finance. And so that's another reason why uh, we're so in, engaged in this conversation at City, just as a global financial institution, um, really thinking through the role of finance institutions like ours that can help promote, enable, and build capacity for these efforts in a way that can connect some of these dots. Uh, to ultimately bring more wealth to communities that need it the most. Um, and so, you know, there's been a, a, I mean, a long history of investments that city can point to, but more recently uh, in this context around the racial wealth gap, I did want to share a couple of highlights of our action for racial equity because um, those commitments that total over a billion dollars in business commitments towards expanding access to finance and banking, uh, building uh, small business capacity and entrepreneurship, uh, supporting home ownership, including some of the work that you're doing, Chris, around uh, mm -hmm. not just thinking about home ownership from a purchasing standpoint, but from a development and developer standpoint as well and production side. Uh, and also just thinking through as a global institution, what it really means to be an anti-racist institution, uh, which is a, you know a, kind of the biggest part of our overall our overarching commitment for action towards racial equity, all of those which those four pillars really gearing towards how do we help close this this racial wealth divide? And I think, you know, to my earlier point earlier, no one of no 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 singular approach is gonna do this for us. But I think collectively the 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 magic can be in this in this concerted effort together. And so uh Julius, do you have do you see a role of financial institutions really you know, or is there more we should be doing, not just as city, but as an industry, connecting that some of the dots that we're making now around uh, some of the points and, and initiatives Chris is describing, things that you're working on, 
things that that we can do as a banking community are, are there things that we should be thinking about in terms of finance Absolutely in finance, because a lot of business owners, my situation with land ownership, we need more equity in the supply chains of these larger uh, economic systems. Uh, just as like with the clothing business, how many of our farmers, uh, how many of our products do we know come from farmers that look like myself? We need to be able to uh, show more equity in our supply lines and uh, uh, all types of industries, but definitely in industries where we do own and own products and own land that can be able to uh, get us the type of uh, financing to be able to uh, scale up our businesses. So, but but what's needed for us is to be able to see our equity, see ourselves in these supply chains, to be able and other companies and other industries seeing uh, more diversity in supply chains and seeing the value of black business owners or people people of color in business being a part of these supply chains and making it equitable for more people so that's how we're going to create more wealth in uh in our black community yeah thank you julius uh, any thoughts there chris in terms of the role of finance yeah i mean an enormous role to play right um you know and and we've seen the 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 banking sector and and other corporate sectors step up in in recent years and, and begin thinking about things differently, right? And so um, we've seen commitments and pledges made by um, um, city and others um, focused on addressing the the racial wealth gap. And um, in our in the affordable housing world, we we see it in um, you know revisiting underwriting standards that have um, precluded. Um, uh, black and brown developers from from being major uh, developers in our space. We've seen it in um, investing purposefully in strategies that target BIPOC-led development teams with debt and equity capital, be it uh, project level or organizational level. And that's one of the pillars of the Equitable Path Forward initiative is providing un, uh, uh, unsecured lines of credit to developers up to $2 million to um, expand their businesses and their portfolios. And then as it relates to the renter, you know, which we talked about as being uh, disproportionately people of color, um, an enormous opportunity to support alternative ownership models. Regina used that word in a prior panel. Um, and I just want to sort of echo that. That's very much in the spirit of what the Renter Wealth Creation Fund is doing. And kind of being willing to look at um, different versions of uh, real estate investments and funds and business investments and, and being more inclusive to the, the community of stakeholders, be it renters or, um, or uh, business owners who stand to benefit um, from the financing. So, um, you know, I think of it as putting mezzanine levels of participation in real estate transactions that benefit the community. Um, as being one way banks and, and other financial institutions can really engage um, in, in the, the, the wealth gap uh, issue. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, Dakara, um, I know we have some questions coming in from the audience. Um, any, any jump out that you think we should start with? Uh, yes, the first question I think we should start with is, how can these opportunities transition from the sharecropping model to true land ownership? Equity matters for generational wealth. Hmm. How can this model, which, can you repeat the question one more time? I just wanna make sure the answer is correctly. Of course. Um, how can this, how can these opportunities transition from the sharecropping model to true land ownership? Equity matters for generational wealth. I, I definitely believe uh, the strong partnerships with the uh, USDA can help people uh, obtain land ownership with, with strong business plans. You can make the right uh, connection with uh, and get uh, and get the right technical assistance to be able to find the, uh, mm -hmm. the loan to be able to start farms with the opportunities now. So you just gotta, especially with people who come from other careers that have like pensions and stuff. There's a lot of opportunities to receive the type of capital to buy your own land to be able to. Start your own business and now farmers are trying to be more lean and possible so uh, uh, lean as possible so i think it, you know you can start a small farm now and it could be more valuable than it ever been you know also what i'm hearing in that question a bit is around you know i, I read a statist statistic recently that you know, i think we talked a little bit about this um last week julius you know apparently only one maybe two percent of all the land in the u.s is owned by 
black people and so i think that has to be a part of the conversation and so that may be another tie into some of the development conversation chris um i just wanted to throw that out there i don't know if there's a thread to pull on there around how to just increase the share of land ownership overall whether it's farmland mm -hmm. or, or otherwise I would say it's about sort of revisiting the the sort of reasons why that's the case, the barriers that exist um, around um, what, what has sort of limited uh, Black families or, or, or households or developers from, from owning a greater and more proportionate share of the land. And obviously there's a list long and, and deep for that. But um, I think something that uh, can be sort of done with partnership with the banking community is sort of revisiting the standards. What, what are the, the barriers to entry for black and brown developers trying to be in the affordable housing space? I assume, Julius, you see the same in, in your community. Um, you know, what are the barriers to accessing financing? And that's, that's part of what Enterprise has tried to dismantle under Equitable Path Forward is taking a fresh look at every one of our underwriting standards with an equity lens, going back to our investors and stakeholders who um, impose those upon us and saying, are these really necessary? And if so, if there are some that are still necessary, can we build bridges to get um, through them? And, and one good example of that through the equitable path forward is we created a standby guarantee facility, recognizing that one of the barriers for BIPOC led developers is having a balance sheet to be able to demonstrate to investors that you can guarantee your project. And so we raised um, philanthropic funding to provide a, a guarantee support to those developers to allow them to do their projects without partnerships. Um, with partnerships are often very extractive and can result in, in the minority developer having to pay a significant share of their um, development fee or other economics in the transaction to a white development partner often. And so um, raising a source of capital that would alleviate the need for that is one of the things within Equitable Path Forward we did to be able to um, allow developers of color to, to build greater wealth, move on to larger projects and build their portfolios. And so, you know, it starts with taking a look at the standards, then it moves on to, well, how can we try and um, bring products and resources to the table that still allow um, developers cover, uh, of color to navigate um, with those standards in place? Um, and so those two things, I think, together can can help to address that, uh, you know, that growing share of land ultimately um, to be owned and controlled by minority real estate firms. Um, I believe with an asset based uh, method of looking at rural economic development, we can find equity in a lot of uh, people of color business led businesses where we may not be able to buy more land and own closer to more than 1% of the land, but we can make our land values higher with the right financing, with the right value added business approach. So, you know, I think uh, relation building relationships with financers uh, is going to be important because while we might not be able to buy more land, we can make our land more valuable by what we add to our businesses and what type of plans and profits we can make off of uh, these relationships with financers to have the capital at the right time to be able to uh, take advantage of opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I just want to do a quick time check uh, to Cara uh, in terms of how many more questions we were able to take. I think we have about three more minutes, so maybe two more questions. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I did notice a question that came in around the uh, commitments that I mentioned from City. So maybe that could just be a quick link we could share in the chat. I just sent that over to you, to Cara. Because uh, I can't access the chat. I just dropped it in there. Thank you. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Uh, what's our next question? Ah, I couldn't find my mute button. Sorry. Um, <laughs> this one is directed to Julius. Can okay. we find equity in POC-owned businesses and make value of currently held lands on uh, with the right approach? Uh, relationships with financiers will be useful by clarifying their value to businesses and positioning themselves with ahead. So I think so that's I um, him to define equity in that. I, I believe that's where that was coming from. So define 
Yeah, you may want to restate it. For <laughs> to, re, to the reframe that, so to really put a fine point on it, Julius, what does equity mean for you for land ownership? Well, I think it's about the opportunities that we can do with the land that we have. Just like, um, I believe, like, I, I'm an advocate for black farmers markets. Like, when black farmers have, provide, um, provide their uh, produce at a farmers market that's dedicated for their space, they can see more value in their products when they compare, uh, then compare it to some other farmers markets where they're the smallest farmer in the farmers market competing against farmers who's trying to use different price points. So I feel like, you know, the way we highlight our farmers and the way we can find extra value just on the strength of the equity that they exist in the marketplace we could be able to make a better land ownership experience for the uh, farmers of color. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more. One more question. So this one is for Chris Herman. Um, how does a, win a renter use your model to build wealth in your program? Can you explicitly walk us through how the model helps Black developers build wealth as well? So that's a two-parter. Two-parter. And I think maybe just to feel the first one quickly, because I think I answered that partially in the prior mm -hmm. comments I was making about how um, part of Equitable Path Forward is really ensuring that the Black developer or, or BIPOC-led developer partners are not forced to uh, bring others in just to compensate them for their balance sheet, as an example. So allowing them to earn greater profits through their work is how uh, a key pillar of that initiative. On the first part of the question, which relates to the Renner Wealth Creation Fund, we're dedicating a significant portion of the profits of our investment strategy to three things, resident services and supports to make sure we're providing pathways for our renters and the properties this fund invests in to become more upwardly mobile. The second thing is direct cash payments, cash back rewards. Every month, residents will have an opportunity to earn about 5% cash back on their rent payment when they pay their rent on time. So this is intended to address right now needs, help people establish emergency savings, pay off debts. It's no strings attached. It's, it's to be used at your discretion, but it is direct cash payments um, in recognition of your good resident. And the third is uh, participation in appreciation of the community, long-term residents of the community, you know, 10 years in the future when and if a property is recapitalized or sold would have an opportunity to participate in the gains from that sale um, as an additional one-time cash back reward. So this is really demonstrating a commitment from our investors to share, to take a portion of their profits that in the typical model go directly to investors and landlords and distribute that in a more equitable way with long-term residents of the community. So again, um, a, a cash payment model, um, hopefully more sizable than the ongoing cash back rewards that we're targeting of 5% um, and more to simulate the experience of home ownership when your home appreciates in value and you have an opportunity to sell or refinance it, um, getting something back at that point in time. So I hope that as succinctly as I could um, summarize the model. Wow. Well, I know it sounds like we're out of time. Um... So really just want to thank you both for this conversation. We could go all day and I'm sure there's more questions and I know we have to uh, kind of cut this short, but I think this just gives a preview uh, for people to really think about so many pieces that we are hoping to connect the dots here. And let's continue the conversation in different ways across our institutions. I think there's a role here and I think I'm going to try to do a, a quick job of summarizing or connecting a few of those dots that I heard. Uh, but I'm sure there's there's so many other ways to, to hear this conversation. Um, I'm hearing the relationship between landlords and renters to really be a critical part of this conversation, that we shouldn't just think about home ownership as a linear strategy, that we have to kind of find define a path to get there through leveraging renters in, in the current renter population. I'm also hearing the connection between small business and land ownership in a different way than I think I've heard typically. Um, and so I think that's something for us to chew on a bit together to think about the different roles that small businesses play with connection to land, not just in the agricultural context even uh, as well, but more so just in terms of sourcing materials, where we get our materials and, and thinking about supply chain in a different way. I'm also hearing a bit about the role that finance can play to really help catalyze these new approaches and, and innovations in a different way. 
uh, outside of the traditional approaches to uh, finance. So uh, there's so many things for us to think about. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Hope folks uh, were able to walk away with a few ideas to, to continue a conversation with other folks who were involved, uh, not just on the panel, but uh, in the audience as well. Thanks so much for having us, Margaret.